Please be seated. So when Smed asked me to preach today, giving testimony to God's work in my life through cancer, I was excited because I knew that I wouldn't just be preaching to a group of Christians in general, but to Grace Bible Church, to my church. And like I alluded earlier, had walked with me in this trial and with whom I will walk through various other trials. God's chosen to bind us together in one body, and I love living life with this body. So last time that I talked, I, I got to talk about how I was shepherding my own heart and how I planned to shepherd my heart in the midst of a trial that I knew was coming. I don't know if you remember it, but as I was up here, the cancer actually invaded while I stood here in my left adrenal gland and started what would be months of unrelenting pain. Uh, led straight to, from here to the hospital. Chemo started, and uh, I wouldn't leave the hospital until the tumor had started to shrink with, with an aggressive chemotherapy regimen called Hyper-CVAD. Very, very aggressive, and, and pretty much wiped me out for those six months. And you guys walked with me through that. And God prepared me so well with what I shared with you that night. And a key part of that was the very text that we're going to look at this morning, which is James 1, 2 through 4. And what I love, what was so encouraging was that exact, I saw in my own life, in the midst of that trial, God do exactly what James 1, 2 through 4 describes. I saw God at work in me to sanctify me through trials, and he has used the various trials surrounding that lymphoma diagnosis to mature me, to sculpt me into Christ's likeness. And I know that I'm not unique to trials, but I love to stand here and say, yes, what God's word says happens, does happen. And I know that God's work in me isn't finished nor is it for this church, so we can anticipate more trials. And we know that we can anticipate that in those trials, God is superintending them for our good and his glory. So I want to shepherd my heart again in your hearts to how do we face the next trial. We can look back and see God at work in, in previous trials, we, but we, can, we need to now consider how we're going to face the next trial that we don't know when it's coming. Or maybe how do you face the trial that you're in today? But this, this sermon is not and it cannot be merely about me or our experiences. So I don't want to talk much about me. I, I want to just open up God's word and see what it says. I want to direct us to God's inspired word, which is sufficient to change us. We can be motivated to change, inspired by examples, by experiences, but it's, it's ultimately God's word that's powerful enough, sharp enough to go to our very core. Weed, us, weed sin out of us and transform us into his image. So with that in mind, I, I want to open up God's word to James 1, 2 through 4. Please do that in your own copy of God's word on your lap and read with me. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, 
lacking in nothing. So in this passage, joy is commanded in trials because true faith testing produces endurance, a means of attaining complete Christian maturity. Joy is commanded in trials. So let's pray, and then we're going to jump into the text. God, again, I, I pray as I've been praying I'm very aware of my weakness, very aware that I'm not even recovered from the trial that you've had me in. And God, I, I pray that you would, despite those weaknesses, help me to speak with clarity. God, just like you told Moses when he said he wasn't eloquent with speech, that you are the one who makes the mouth mute, that you're dumb. God, you're the one who provides every weakness, and, and yet you will use those tools to accomplish what you will with them. And so, God, I, I pray that you would give me clarity, help me think well here, even while I'm struggling to, to have clear thoughts. God, I pray that through your word being preached, that you would the fact that you would change the, the hearts, that you would sanctify those who hear, that this wouldn't be a day about any one person, but it would be a day about, about you, that, that where your word is preached and you are revealed, you would be glorified. I pray that you would use me as a tool for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So in, in James chapter 1, verse 2, after his greeting at the beginning of the letter, the first words out of James's mouth are pure joy, are all joy. That's how he starts his letter. The context is going to be suffering. So the last thing you might expect him to lead with is all joy. And he isn't being thoughtless, flippant, or impossibly idealistic. He knows that to lead with all joy when speaking to people who are undergoing real trials, it may sound thoughtless at best and or at worst and shocking at best, but James, he knows his readers. They're scattered Jewish Christians, and he knows that they were undergoing real sufferings. They were in need of real encouragement. In real trials. So James starts with a difficult but right teaching about how we should respond in trials, and that's considering them all joy. James is the half brother of Jesus, he was a key leader in Jerusalem. And you can remember that the storyline of Acts it reveals that. God was using increasing persecution in and around Jerusalem, right, to scatter his followers out, to bring the gospel out to, from Jerusalem out to the very ends of the world, as you saw Paul go out. But you know that in Jerusalem, there was certainly struggles and trials and persecutions for Christians. James saw that. He experienced it. So he couldn't speak flippantly about trials as if, He'd never experienced them or seen them. The, the book, he alludes to some trials that he knows people are going through, even including all the way of probably people, the rich, unrighteous people withholding wages so that Christians were starving. He, maybe even all the way to the point of death in, in chapter 5. But tenderly, his goal here. And James 1 is, is to be a loving shepherd, a loving brother who seeks to align himself with himself under and alongside his readers in their joy and trials. So James immediately inserts, my brethren, count it all joy, my brothers, my brethren. This, it, it aligns himself with them 
it softens it. He, he acknowledges that they are his brothers through uh, their mutual faith in Christ. But it doesn't soften the shockingness of his all joy command. We, we often think of joy as a spontaneous emotion, a spontaneous response that we don't have much control over, right? Um, the birth of a baby, your team wins the Super Bowl, you get a present or a sign of affection from someone you love, and joy just comes out. That's natural, right? If you finally graduate or you get the vacation destination that you're longing for, joy happens, why is that? It's because joy comes when you get what you prize. Joy is the natural response to receiving what you prize. And you don't have to be a Christian to experience this natural response of joy in positive circumstances, right? That's just God's common grace to all still in this world. Things that we cherish, we esteem, we treasure, or we value. When we get these things, and many of them are good, right? It's it's right to be joyful when we get those and to recognize as Christians that they're good gifts from God. And James even even commands us to, in James chapter 5, 13, he says, if you're cheerful, sing praise. Uh, but, but the response is much more. The response here for this joy is much more than the natural, spontaneous, not, re- not requiring effort type of joy. Right? If joy comes when you get what you prize, how could you be joyful in trials? Because trials seem to threaten many of the things that tend to make us spontaneously joyful. That's why joy is so difficult in trials. Right, you're typically joyful when you get comfort that you're longing for. Trials take away comfort, take away health, possibly loved ones, money, hope, or any number of things that if we attained them, we would naturally have joy. Look down at verse 2 of James 1. What is the command here? It's not merely be joyful, right? What is the command? It's consider. James commands his readers to consider it joy when they face various trials. And, and this word is an intellectual process. It's, it's different than that spontaneous joy that I was talking about. It's a, it could be translated, that word consider, to think or regard or make a judgment or determination. You don't have to think real hard to have joy when your boss calls you into the office and gives you a promotion and a raise. But what about when he calls you into the office and a demotion comes or termination? The Christian must engage his or her mind in this moment in order to count this and any other trial that we encounter all joy. And that's because the gain of faith testing in the trial, the gain that's to be had as our faith is tested is actually greater than that which is lost in the trial. Joy comes when you get what you prize. And as we'll see in verses three through four, ultimately our trials are used by God to gain us that which cannot come apart from faith testing. Just like an an athlete who longs to get bigger, faster, stronger, win a competition, there's no shortcuts to that. That that athlete has to go through the grueling trial of training and painful workout. And that that athlete may endure under that trial for the the hope of the, the goal that they may attain. All that much more, the Christian who longs for holiness in life, who longs to be able to honor God with their life, to be formed into the complete Christian, that complete mature Christian that God intends them to be, they can look at their trials and recognize them as the means that God will use to accomplish that goal. And in that, they can count it all joy. 
So we're going to learn for the rest of this morning of God's intent to use trials to generate complete Christian maturity in us through perseverance. And ultimately, it is this perseverance under trial that demonstrates God's saving work in us, right? It brings us safely out of life and into eternal life forever. James 1.12 said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And it's not just James who speaks of this joy in trials. The author of Hebrews speaks of the result of holiness that God's training of us through trials brings. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 says, God disciplines us or trains us for our good, that we may share his holiness. And for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. So understanding that God uses trials to train us towards righteousness, that should lead us to joy, right? If we prize righteousness and we know that God uses trials to train us towards righteousness, that should lead us to joy. And that's a joy that the, the recipients of the letter of Hebrews demonstrated. And he, he wrote about it just two chapters earlier, 1034. He said, you joyfully accepted the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Joy at work in trials. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.17 about looking, right? This is a a looking with his mind, a considering, an act of similar to this considering or counting in, in James, eternal things before earthly temporal ones to recognize that trials were a gracious preparation for the glory of heaven. Second Corinthians four seventeen through 18. Paul writes, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. It's not just James, the author of Hebrews, and Paul, but Peter does it too. Peter speaks of various trials in 1 Peter 1, 6, and the testing of faith in very similar language to James. Just turn over to 1 Peter 1, 6 and look at this. I love hearing the pages turn. First Peter 1 6. Peter writes, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So we've heard from James, the author of Hebrews, Paul, Peter. If we, if we have prayed for holiness, if you personally have prayed for holiness or longed for holiness, you should count trials as joy because they're God's means of answering that prayer. If we want to be useful to God, if you've prayed that God would make you useful to him, able to do more of those good works that he prepared beforehand, before your salvation, you might walk in them, as Ephesians 2.10 refers to. We must count trials as joy. This is the means that God uses to form us into that, that Christian. Sorry. 
if we trust God, we must count trials as joy. Because those trials prove that God is trustworthy. The testing of our faith shows us that that very faith was given to us by God. And so Christians can count trials as joy. One commentator writes on this verse, our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. I want you to think not just abstractly about trials now. I want you to think about the way that you respond in trials. Think back to the last one or anticipate the trial that may be around the corner that you fear. This is very real for me. This is, I'm, my, my PET scans looked very bad. I, I'm at high risk of this cancer coming back at any second. As you guys know, my son's fought leukemia for years, very high risk of returning, and who knows what other kinds of trials we may face. I have to ask myself, how will I respond in that trial? And it will reveal what I value. Or when I respond rightly, I can rejoice because it shows that God has changed my valuations from the heart. So think of yourself as I read this. Our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter, not better. So when trials come, immediately give thanks to the Lord and adopt a joyful attitude. And now, now back to James 1, 2. Flip back to James. Notice that James doesn't merely say, consider it joy, right? What does he say? Consider it all joy. This doesn't mean that the only situation in which you have jo- that, that you can have joy is trials, as if joy and trial is all the joy that there is in life, right? As I've said, it's right to be joyful in all circumstances, and the Christian can have special joy and blessing or rescue out of, tri- out of trial, as we talked about at communion knowing that these good things are from the Lord. But what it does mean, what all joy does mean, is an exceedingly high goal, but it's attainable and right. In the trial, the totality of our response should be joy. This is a joy that's not mixed with reactions contrary to it. It doesn't mean that you don't have pain in your joy, but you won't have grumbling in your joy, right? That's what all joy means. You can't fake a a joyful response on your face and have something else in your heart. This is a response. That's why I say pure joy. It's a joy unmixed, untainted by that which can't coexist with joy. But it's, it's real that there's pain. You're not commanded to pursue a trial as if, oh, I can't wait because that's where I get my joy. It's right to have joy elsewhere. But when you find yourself in a trial, you are to consider it all joy. And if you don't see all joy as your response to trial, don't despair. Because think about what this, verse actually, what the, this passage actually reveals. If when you face trial, your response isn't all joy, but a a desire to have joy, God will use that very trial to produce in you the sanctification leading to maturity so that in the next trial, you will do better at responding with all joy. So give joy now in this trial because God is forming you to have more joy in the next. That's what's so sweet is even in, in the toughest of circumstances, God is at work superintending the trial that he allows God is actually going to use the testing of your faith in trial to perfect you, to mature you into one who is more able to respond 
with joy in trial. So I, I know that this might sound like an ephemeral discussion that might be appropriate to consider when things are comfortable. Something that sounds good from the pulpit but doesn't actually play in real life. I've even heard it suggested that this is not a helpful place to go in Scripture when one is facing trial. It sounds patronizing to the one who's suffering as if you're minimizing their hurt. What they really need is someone to listen to their trouble and feel their grief with them, not to tell them to consider that their very real suffering is a means that God will use to, to mature them. I'm not saying that we don't Walk patiently with others. This is not primarily a verse that you preach to another. This is primarily a text that you preach to your own heart. I want you to listen right now so that you can preach this sermon to yourself when you need it. You don't know when that trial's coming. It could be as simple as a stubbed toe or a car accident. Last time I, I gave that example of you don't know when the trial's coming, when guy, I, I gave the example of a broken down car and within an hour, a guy called me in the church and said his car had broken down. Thank you for, for preaching that, that message. You don't know what's coming, but prepare your heart now to respond rightly when it comes by considering it joy, saying even in this trial, right, it's, it's trials of various kinds, the Lord is actually testing your faith and going to be producing endurance, resulting in maturity through that test. And I can say that I, I know how hard this is. I, I shepherded my heart with this text. Um, as my son, as I, I faced the probability of my son's death with a second relapse of leukemia, the pressure in his brain from the, the cancer surrounding his brain was so high, his, his eyes went cross-eyed, pushing on nerves. He was lethargic, couldn't speak, just moaned in pain. How do I count that all joy? I know that as I speak, I know I'm not the only one who's done this, so I'm not trying to make example of myself other than to say I, I, I'm not speaking as if this is easy or flippant. Uh, watching my best friend die from sudden onset cancer, leaving behind a Bible translation and an evangelism task among the dough people unfinished, leaving a wife without a husband and children without a father. I sought to shepherd my heart with this, counting my own excruciating pain, loss of strength, inability to walk and think, extreme nausea, separation from family, and the very real possibility of death. I, I shepherded my heart to count that as all joy, because in those moments, my faith was being tested, and God had superintending purposes in that. God was not absent from that trial. But actually, each one of those trials is used in the life of the believer to gain something better than those things that is lost. And that's endurance, resulting in Christian maturity and an endurance that perseveres to the end all the way to salvation, to heaven. What's the worst thing that a trial could result in? Humanly terms, human terms, death, right? All that that brings for us is Joy with Christ. And if it doesn't bring death, it prepares us for heaven, right? Like Paul said, these slight momentary afflictions. The worst thing it could do is last your whole life. In 10,000 years, that'll seem like a blink of an eye. What about in 100,000 years? In 100 million years? Eternity is so long. And these slight momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, right? These aren't even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. And yet, despite, despite that reality, I, I'm saying I know this is hard, 
but it's something that, that we do in our mind. It's something that, that's actually, you have to obey the command to consider. So it's, you can't go into this and just say, oh, I'm going to see what naturally comes out. You prepare your heart with the knowledge that's going to enable the right response. It's going to enable the right consideration, the right evaluation of what's truly important when you hit the trial. Look at the response of the apostles being flogged for preaching Jesus in Acts 5.41. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll just read it. They went on their way rejoicing after being flogged and threatened because they'd been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. The disciples had had their priorities realigned and could look at their trial and at their pain and consider, right? They could consider, they could reckon, they could count it as an occasion for joy. The same Holy Spirit that empowered that supernatural response in them is at work in me and in, at work in you, believer. And the great thing is he will actually use trials. If you look at that and say, I could never respond like that. The great news is you have some trials coming that will form you into a person that can respond like that if that's what God has for you in your future. God will sustain us in trials. And he will use trials as a means to make us endure. He will not give us a trial we cannot endure if we are his own. And joy, if joy comes from getting what we prize most, for the Christian, what better result is there than to see God at work in us, making us more holy, so we can take comfort and have joy because of his superintending purposes and even the hardest trial that he allows his children to face and in which he sustains them. And when an outside world looks in and sees genuinely joyful response to trial, it's a clear testimony that the Christian is very different from them. Right? What sets a Christian apart from, say, a Mormon? From the outside world looking in when everything's good, it might be very hard to determine. but give you two cancer and there better be a dramatic difference. Have your child die? The tested genuineness of your faith will be shown. And in that, you can count it all joy. So remember that consider here, it's a command. It's not optional or a suggestion and it's a, re it's a word that requires action. It's not just spontaneous. It calls for a deliberate mental evaluation and valuing of what is lost and what is gained in the trial. What is lost in the trial is real and it hurts. But it is far eclipsed by the value of what is being accomplished by those trials in the life of a Christian. And this will result, this must result in counting the trial as all joy. This doesn't, this doesn't mean you get really good as, as you mature in the Christian life. You get better at hiding your emotions, looking good. That is not what we're after here. But the Christian is by the Holy Spirit to determine what God is seeking to accomplish, that is to determine that what God is seeking to accomplish in this trial is of far greater value than what you're losing. And genuine joy must result a joy that flows from an act of your renewed will from your changed heart that now prizes God and his glory and his purposes above your own and sincerely trusts God and his purposes. MacArthur helpfully comments, we are not just to act joyful in reluctant pretense, but to be genuinely joyful. It's a matter of will, not of feelings and should be the conscious, determined commitment of every faithful believer. And because God commands it, it is within the ability, under the Spirit's provision, of every true Christian. When faith in Jesus Christ is genuine, James assures us, even the worst troubles can 
and should be cause for thanksgiving and rejoicing. If you look back down at James 1, 2, we're back in the text, it's, what is the occasion for all joy? It's when you face trials, of, when you face various trials. First, just look at the when. It's easy to twist this and say, I, uh, looking back at the trial, I can have joy, because I'm out of it now, right? But this is actually saying when, in the midst of the trial, count it joy. And, and the translation encounter, it doesn't really capture everything in the word, right? When you encounter trials, the, this word, it's, it's elsewhere translated. The only two other instances in, in the New Testament are when, in the story of the Good Samaritan, the, um, the man falls into the robbers, into the hands of the robbers. It, you encounter, but you really run headlong into a situation that you didn't want to be in, a troubling situation. The other is when Paul and his Rome-bound ship runs into a reef, right? James knows this isn't like, oh, count it all joy when you, I, I don't even know how you would say that, when you, when you pursue trials of various kinds. It, trials are not something that we are supposed to pursue. They're not, this doesn't mean that you're commanded to pursue desire trials as if, uh, hey, let me go look for the next difficult situation I can get myself into. <laughs> it, it's, that's not what this, is, what this is saying. Yet when you encounter, when you smack into like a ship hitting a reef, when your ship does hit a reef, joy. This is not a this doesn't result in spontaneous joy. This is not a good situation. Yet I can count it all joy because I know that in this God has God will superintend this for good, for ultimately my endurance and maturity. Right? James has all kinds of trials in mind. He doesn't limit it. It's trials of various kinds. It's not merely persecution for faith or the really big ones. It's it's anything that is an occasion for the testing of your faith. Because true faith testing, I means testing of true faith, produces endurance. That's James 1.3. The verse starts with knowing that. This knowing that is closely connected with the considering. You have to, in order to consider it joy, you have to have a, a knowledge that, that isn't just natural, that doesn't come from merely looking at your circumstances. And there's a, a knowing that that's... Uh, very important knowledge that enables the considering. You must know that faith testing produces endurance that will result in complete maturity. And this knowledge comes from Scripture. And you must know that the tested genuine faith, endurance, and complete Christian maturity are to be greatly desired. And this knowledge and desire, it will only come through saturating your heart and mind with God's word. You need to prepare your heart to respond like this, to desire these things by saturating your heart and mind with God's word. You don't wait until the trial to start doing that, but you anticipate the trial that's coming and put before you God and his his glory, who he is, who he reveals himself to be, his goodness, his trustworthiness, so that when you face that trial, you can trust him. And ultimately, we see that a trial, which has an idea of testing in it, right? A trial is the testing of not just you, but it's the testing of your faith. You you can't help but think of Abraham when you hear this, right? Abraham, I'm going to test your faith. I, I promised you that I'm going to, through Isaac make a a great people, will you go kill Isaac, sacrifice him for me? I I don't know how this is going to work, Abraham thinks, but I I can trust. And there is a testing of faith in what certainly was the most difficult trial of his life. But it's not just those kinds of things, but really every difficulty that you face will ultimately be a testing of your faith. Do you believe that God is sovereign? Do you believe that he is actually over all things? And do you believe that he is good? 
right? If, if you run into a hard situation and your response is grumbling, what you are declaring in that as you fail your test of faith is, I either don't believe God is good, right? He's powerful enough to get me into the situation or out of it, but he must not be good, so I'm going to grumble. Or he's good, but he wasn't powerful enough to get me out of this. Grumbling is a failure of the test of faith. It's the opposite of joy. It's why you, you can't mix this joy with grumbling. What about anxiety? It's, it's much the same. You can see that each trial is an opportunity to have your, ta- your faith tested. Do you cling to God in hope? Or do you hope in money? Right, that's... For, for me in, in my trials, it was a, a testing where do I hope in God or do I trust in chemo or doctors? It, it's often we, we don't realize until God strips away that that we trust in most, which is like why trials, you lose your money, you lose your health, you lose your mind, whatever. It's, it's that all of a sudden God's taking away that that you trust in and you start to see, oh, wow, there was sin there that I didn't even realize. And it's through that testing of faith that God will chisel away like a master sculptor um, the things that need to be gone so that you can be made into uh, exactly what he he has for you. I'm going to jump forward to verse 4. Sorry, I went long on the first part. So verse 4 is, is, this is a, the, True faith testing, it produces endurance. And endurance is a means of attaining complete Christian maturity. There's, we hit the next command here in, in verse 4. It says, let endurance have its perfect result. So trials produce endurance, right? Just like a, well, I won't, trials produce endurance. And endurance, though, is not the ultimate goal of faith testing. So you don't merely have joy because you get endurance. But endurance isn't the ultimate goal of faith testing. It's important, but endurance intends something even greater for the believer. It intends a, what's described here as a perfect result or a complete result. Notice that verse 4 contains the second command of this passage. It says, let, our endurance, let endurance have its perfect result. So you're to sort of get out of the way and let endurance do its thing. It describes a person who habitually doesn't get in the way of the endurance produced in verse 3. You do this by counting trials as joy, looking forward to God's sanctifying work in you through the trial. And what is the perfect result? It's so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is the climax of the goal of these verses, and it's God's good goal for us in the trial, the perfect result. And and that word translated perfect can also have the idea of complete or or mature, um, measuring completely up to a standard or being completely developed. It's, we, we can't, it can't mean that we attain perfection as in sinlessness in this life, right? The Bible's clear that we won't attain that. We're still in a mixed condition living here on the earth, yet as we mature as Christians, we are to become closer and closer to this sinless Christ-like goal. But this perfect, when you see that word perfect, um, you, you can mature as a, a translation that's seen often in the New Testament for that. It's it's the opposite of being infantile or childish. It's a spiritual maturity. It's the, the goal that God intended for you when he saved you. James further clarifies what he means. The result into which the Christian is being formed through the trial. It's, it's not only mature, right? It's, it's also it's a complete maturity. It's mature and complete. There's no one who can claim that they're perfectly mature and complete without any spot or blemish while living in this world. Right? It's a process of perfecting that will continue until glory. But at the same time, we can accurately describe Christians as mature, as Christ-like, 
And it is into this form that we're increasingly being molded. And I guarantee you that when you see a Christian who is mature, who's close, who's starting to approximate that form of Christ-likeness that that God saves us and is molding us into, you can say that person's clearly been through some trials. It's like God is a master sculptor taking a, a piece of stone that's us when he saves us and He chisels off and polishes out imperfections until the sculpture is all that he intends it to be, right? It's it's complete. God uses the trials to produce endurance, which is the means of attaining that complete Christian maturity. Initially, big chunks and obvious huge defects are chiseled off. It's hard to even see the form that you're taking. And then details will become etched into place. Imperfections are polished off. Master Sculptor steps back and evaluates his work until it's complete, and he'll continue to chisel and polish away. And in the same way, God uses trials to produce the endurance that's needed to shape us into mature Christians that he saved us to be back when he started this journey of faith. And each step of the way, our faith is tested and it's proven to be the handiwork of God. We can rejoice in that, right? When you face a trial and you see yourself come through stronger than you did before, you can thank God. You praise God. You don't say, hey, look at me. I, I, did, I did better this time. You say, God, thank you for the faith that you put in me and that in the testing of my faith, it proved itself genuine. That in past tests, You've formed endurance in me. And through that endurance brought maturity. And thank you for making me more and more and more into that complete image. Or that that mature that image of a mature Christian into which you're forming me. And years into our Christian life and after joyful endurance and trial, we'll no longer struggle with what we once did, but new defects that we were never aware of are shown. Trials have a good way of uncovering and displaying what still needs work. What we were never aware of was there. Like I said, if you're stripped of the money in your bank account, you see whether or not you were relying, your hope was in money. When you um, are stripped of your health, you can see whether or not you were hoping in your own strength. And God will relieve you of those sins that you weren't even aware that you had as he forms you more and more into his image. God shows us what is still lacking in our faith and chisels it away through trials so that we can be prepared to handle what is next. In years into our walk, we can endure with joy trials that we never dreamt were possible on the first day. I can testify that that's been my experience. One commentator comments on verse 4, in the midst of hardship, people sometimes guess what they should learn from it. They say, oh, the Lord will teach me patience through this, or I will trust God more completely. That may be true, but the Lord can indeed deepen patience or trust through trials, but James doesn't say that a trial produces any one particular virtue. Rather, James 1.4 says that perseverance leads to maturity in general. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And there's no virtue that trials can't build, no defect that trials can't remedy, no strength that trials cannot impart. And if you don't have faith, this hope in trials, this joy that trials is actually forming something in you, that that can't be yours. Because the testing of your faith will not produce endurance or maturity or any good thing. Rather, trials will only serve to reveal what is in you. A sinful heart that will sin in trial rather than persevere. Contrast that to the Christian who ultimately when you face a trial and your faith is tested, you will persevere. Because that faith is God's. It was put in you and the Holy Spirit um, 
you will not be tested beyond what you can endure. It doesn't mean you're going to endure perfectly, but you will endure. Your faith will be tested and show what is there. But if you don't believe, you will not be able to nor want to honor God in your trial. And ultimately, apart from faith, no matter how hard you try or how many rules you keep, you will face God when you die with your sins still on you. But turn from your sins. Trust God in Jesus' sufficient death to save you from your sins, to form you into his image and secure eternal life with him. So if you're not sure if you, that you're a Christian or if you know that you're not, please don't leave here without talking to me. Please turn to Jesus in faith. Remember, we aren't saved by our perseverance, but we persevere because we're saved. Our salvation and even our perseverance is ultimately from God. And just as surely as he will use endurance in trials to sanctify us, endurance in trials show us who he is. Perseverance is the result of salvation, and those who persevere receive the crown of life. It says just a few verses later, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we don't endure by our own strength, but only because of and as evidence of God who will love and keep us until the end. God is so committed to your salvation that he sent his son to die for you, Christian. We can't doubt his willingness to work all things together for your good, and namely trials to grow you into complete maturity of faith and ultimately bring us home to eternal life with him. In that day, our joy won't be mixed with pain, trials, or suffering. Even the worst of our sufferings that we can endure in this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed in us. These slight momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. In endurance in trials, the testing of our faith is genuine, and God's use of trials to mature us are all evidence that we will have this eternal life with our God. So count it joy when you face trials of various kinds. Let's sing together. As soon as... Just, sorry. God, I praise you that you are at work in trials, that you are committed to finish what you began and you will sustain us until the end. God, thank you for the gospel. It is indeed our only hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.